You know how you know if someone's actually retired? If they make their actual retirement video one year after they retire instead of one year before. The reason is, is because a lot of YouTubers, they, they don't actually retire early from doing what they say. They do it from having a large YouTube channel. But yeah, I just did mine the old school, old fashioned way. Save a lot of money, invest the money, don't spend so much money. And yeah, that's really all there is to it. And no, I didn't go to some Ivy League school. I didn't make 200K out of college as a software engineer. I didn't even invest in cryptocurrency and like had a skyrocket like 10x growth on my investments or something like that. And I was actually too busy just living my retired life to have time to make my retirement YouTube video, but I'm a bit bored now, so I'm making it now, so give me a break, all right? It's not like I didn't have my own source of privilege in my life, but I'm so sick of the people who went to Harvard, made 200K the first year out of school at like 21 years old, and they're like, yeah, I retired early at like before 30. Uh, I was like a banker on Wall Street. Like, no, like, <laughs> I did not make any ridiculous amount of money. In fact, my final salary was lower than a lot of people's starting salaries out of college. And I also lived in a very expensive city. I lived in Washington, D.C. While it's not as expensive as San Francisco or New York, it's pretty much right under that. But the difference between me and everyone else in my age group is that I did things properly and I'm very, I guess, disciplined. I wouldn't really describe myself as disciplined, but if I really care about something, I will be. And that is the case because I really hated my job like a lot of people my age. Office jobs were just not something that people were meant to ever do. So as soon as I started my job, I created a plan. I learned from some blogs of people who did this before. And yeah, it's just ruthless execution, as my friend would put it, on early retirement. But in this video, I'm going to show you guys how to do exactly what I did. No matter your situation, you can actually retire early if you want as well. With hard work, strong execution, and like just a tiny bit of thinking outside the box, all of the things I've done is actually able to be done by the majority of the population, at least in the US, because I'm from the US, so that's where I'm most familiar with. But yeah, it's finally done. Like, quit my job over a year ago, actually. And it took me five and a half years of working. You know the term quiet quitting? Yeah, I, I did quiet quitting before it was cool. I pretty much discovered quiet quitting in my head right as I got into the workforce. And towards the end of my career, people would go up to me and be like, man, how did you do it? Because I'm known as a person who did the bare minimum to get promoted at like one of the faster rates. So yeah, if you want to learn how to do that, like yeah, I would keep watching this video. If you don't want to, you don't have to watch this video. You could be completely lazy and idiotic or you could be super hardworking and I would argue idiotic as well because I feel like what I did is the best balance of getting the most out of what you put in, which is essentially what working is, right? But one of my close friends, he grew up in a different background than I did, and he introduced me to the early retirement lifestyle. And he said my execution of the financial independence retire early plan was clinical. And from all my nifty tricks from saving on expenses, maximizing my existing assets, and just doing the bare minimum to get promotions at my nine to five job, and also making slightly riskier investments than what my peers would do or what the other retire early crowd would do as well, that definitely sped up the process a lot. But the story you're about to hear is so tried and true, it's almost overdone at this point. Uh, it's another cis straight Asian male <laughs> retiring early, I guess. Um, if this was 10 years ago, I guess that would be cool, but it's 2022 right now. And for some reason, you gotta have something special or different about you to make it on social media. But let's rewind the clock to 2015 where the story started right as I left college. So senior fall, I did on-campus recruiting at a top 50 university. Those aren't that great. And when I say top 50, I mean like barely top 50. As rated by US News, which is a bottom tier newspaper, but everyone values their college ranking so much. At least I had a business degree. It wasn't a STEM degree, but it's better than a philosophy degree or an art history degree. But of course your major doesn't matter if you do have a brain. Uh, that's the key asterisk in that point. I'm told that I do have a brain and I majored in finance and marketing. So whenever people say they don't use the information they learned in college, they probably just majored in the wrong things because I actually learned like a little bit about these two topics in college. Like finance, you learn how to value companies, of course, a lot of the stuff is theoretical, so you just have to understand what's theoretical and what applies to the real world. Marketing, uh, I guess marketing, you learn about it everywhere. Marketing is like the psychology of business. It's not really a real major, but people like to pretend that it's a field. And it is very important because marketing does make or break a lot of businesses. It's just not a hard science is what I'm trying to say. I guess you could argue that marketing helped me do my own branding. Um, I did make eventually like a gaming YouTube channel, but like, 
I don't make that much money off of that. It's more for fun, purely for fun. And I made enough off of just saving money and investing it that uh, my side YouTube income, it's mainly just like my luxury spending money, but it's not my fire fund by any means. But YouTube also isn't really that hard either. <laughs> like you really just need to find a niche and grow from there. I, I guess marketing can help some people, but if, as long as you have common sense, you can make it in whatever field you want. I also had a physics minor, so in case you guys don't know what that means, it means that all physics people, they just look up the answers on Chegg, and yeah, that's pretty much how you pass physics class. You might be wondering, why do I have a physics minor? It's because I actually could have graduated earlier, but my parents wanted me to stay in college for four years, so I just took up a minor, and yeah, we did it that way. For those wondering, I actually didn't want to go to college, so college is a huge waste of around 200 grand. Most colleges cost around 50,000 per year, plus room and board and living expenses, that's another 10 to 20 grand, depending on how much you live it up or whatever. So, uh, but yeah, imagine working on literally any other project in your life for four years. You're gonna come out with a product and knowledge that's much greater than anything you could learn in college. Like, I, I swear to God, I don't know why they promote going to college so much. The only reason why I can think of is because they want colleges to make a lot of money and because it looks good on paper and because it's one of those things that isn't merit-based. College is one of those things where if you just do the time, you get the reward and the credentials, and that just doesn't work out for any other field in a meritocracy. Because normally in a meritocracy, the best succeed and the best stand out, but in a lot of things in life, it's more years of experience is valued rather than what skills you bring to the table. If you look at any government job, for example, the pay goes higher the more years you spent on the job. Keep in mind, the more time you do spend on something, on average, you will be better at it, but that doesn't mean someone coming in their first year isn't smarter than someone who has 15 years experience. You see this a lot in sports, where one rookie can be better than this 20-year vet that, yeah, just is an average player, and the rookie is phenomenal. In a lot of cases, that rookie plays that sport better than the veterans, and yeah, <laughs> sports is much more meritocratic than a lot of other things in life, which is a little strange if you ask me. Back to the topic of college, I really only recommend going to college if you could get into a top 10 or maybe top 20 university, or if you just want to party, because yeah, that's mainly what it's for. All in all, the only thing college helped me with was on-campus recruiting, which got me a above average job. I'm not gonna say it was a bad job. I'm also not gonna say it was an exceptional job. It was definitely above average though. But yeah, unfortunately, there's this thing called affirmative action, and in that company, it was a consulting firm. I was one of the very few people who actually had consulting experiences through internships. But for some reason, I was paid less than everyone else who didn't. This was very apparent because in one of the training events, there are a lot of terms that I was the only person in the room that knew what it was, yet I was paid the least. The only thing I could guess on why that is, on why I'm paid less than everyone else when they did not have consulting internships was the fact that affirmative action exists and like Asian males in that field just there are too many of them I don't know why this is a thing but yeah it's just not a meritocracy at all but a story on that another time because that is just way too big of a topic to get into I really hate talking about this stuff because it's very cheap but the thing is from everything I've observed throughout my entire life it really just exists when they say like race doesn't matter like <laughs> just look at MCAT scores for getting into medical school based on race and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But yeah, I feel like my demographic is the worst demographic in the woke West. Uh, this topic is something I feel very strongly about because it's part of the reason why I'm retiring early. I noticed this very broken system when I was applying into high school. So I actually got waitlisted at one of the best high schools in the country. Uh, it's called Andover, but all my scores, they're above average of all the acceptances. And I ended up going to maybe like some people consider it like a tier one school, but it's like a low tier one, high tier two type of uh, elite school. So I guess if you would compare it to a college, it's like a Cornell. It's like part of the elite group, but it's like the lowest on the totem pole. But yeah, I actually had all the grades, all the test scores, all the extracurriculars to actually get into the best school. And I think if I did push, I may have gotten in, but yeah. It's just not a fair system because I got waitlisted at the school I actually went to as well, which was like the bottom tier one school. And that's where I learned that race does affect things because there's just no other explanation around that. And then I go into the school and then the people there are just complete idiots, right? Like it's typical private school stuff. Like half the kids are 
hooked up on Adderall pills. The other half are like drug dealers. It's like very typical private school stuff. But again, I don't want to talk about this too much in this video, but it is the reason why I wanted to retire early ever since that day, because I just knew the system was completely broken for my demographic. Maybe it's not for you, in which case you should take advantage of that. Um, but if it is also broken for you, it doesn't have to be my exact demographic. A lot of demographics get screwed over. Uh, you might want to consider early retirement to just quit the game as soon as possible, you know? Uh, but let's get back to working. Let's get on to the fun stuff, I guess. So essentially, I started working and I hated it immediately. So I guess it's not that fun. First, they told me I need to be ready by a certain month. So they said, oh, you are starting in August. So I'm like, all right, let me get my housing set up for August. Let me prepare for a move. You know, it's a big move, your first move out of college, right? And then they just, a month before, they're like, you know what? You're actually starting in October. But all my peers, including myself, we already booked housing arrangements from August. So we're just two months in the hole on living expenses for no reason. I felt so cheated by my company. And yeah, it, we live in DC or the Northern Virginia area. And that is a very expensive area. In fact, some of the most expensive zip codes, the top 10 zip codes in the US that are the most expensive, I think like six of them are in the DC metro area. That's just to put into perspective how expensive this place is. And yeah, are you really telling me that a couple college students are just in the hole for like one or two months of rent just because the company just says, oh, nope, you're actually starting two months later, like pretty much right before we were supposed to move in. How ridiculous is that? <sighs> Again, we weren't making that much. Out of college, I was making 65,000. My peers were making 70,000. And then the like super duper like first round draft picks or whatever you want to call them, we're making 75,000. Like, again, my job was above average, but it wasn't anything insane. Like, I know some people out of college, you go to Google, you make like 180,000 per year. Uh, you go to Goldman Sachs, you're doing something similar. But yeah, like, I did have an above average job, but it wasn't anything ridiculous, if you ask me. Like, the average out of college job is around, I guess it's like 50 or $60,000, somewhere around there. It depends on what your major is. But for business, I, I definitely was above average. I'm not denying that. But I still felt cheated because I had more internships in the relevant fields compared to all my peers. But yeah, it's just a weird system, if you ask me. So the whole moving your start date thing, it made me feel completely powerless. And I was just screwed, right? There's no getting around that. After that moment, I vowed to never let a company take advantage of me ever again. And ironically, at this point, I never heard about the financial independent retire early system. I actually wanted to still grind it out a little bit. I was like, you know what? Despite all this affirmative action nonsense, uh, despite the fact that I have to compete against all the rich kids from China with like private tutors and their whole lives and the geniuses from like Vietnam, like the math champion from Vietnam, I have to compete against those people because they're in like my demographic. <laughs> Once I get into the workforce, you know what? If it's not too difficult to grind it out to get to partner at a consulting firm, you know, maybe I can do it. Let's see what happens, right? Uh, but then I saw Financial Independence Retire Early. I read a blog by Mr. Money Mustache, and I was like, that's math makes sense. The math checks out. There's nothing ridiculous about that. I was always into investing in the early years of my life, even though I never actually invested that much money until obviously when I started working because I didn't have money before. I started working, right? However, I made a classic budgeting mistake. A lot of people, <laughs> when they start out their work career, they're like, you know what? This salary is the lowest salary I'm ever gonna make, so I can spend all of it. That's how they think. My brother thinks like this. He's gonna be a doctor. And he's like, you know what? My residency salary, it's a little low, but I can spend all of it because the rest of my life, I'll be making more as a doctor, right? This is like rookie mistake number one. You should always be trying to at least save a little bit of money because nothing in life is guaranteed. This quickly changed my perspective after the start date move fiasco. Who knew that one of the biggest companies of our time treated their supposedly college recruits so badly? <laughs> There's actually this kid from Georgetown. That company's blacklisted at Georgetown now because he complained so much about them because of the start date move thing. Yeah, if you guys are asking, I'm talking about like private schools, I'm talking about like, oh, top 50 universities are bad. If you guys can't notice yet, I did come from a privileged background, but the friend who actually showed me about financial independence retire early had drastically different circumstances and therefore his outlook on life in terms of money was completely different as well. And it actually 
was really good for both of us because we were able to share our knowledge to combine it and two different perspectives on life maximizing for the same goal you lead to some it leads to some crazy stuff i saw the fire blog and i was just completely hooked right away i stopped everything what i was doing and right there i guess i was quiet quitting already because i was just reading financial blogs the whole time I was at work. A spreadsheet and one hour of company time later, I had a projection of how I could conservatively retire in around 10 years. And 5.5 years later, I achieved it. <laughs> you legit just make as much money as possible in as little time as possible. That's all you have to do. And spend as little as possible as well. There, Boom, I just killed all the financial YouTube channels in existence because that's really what it comes down to. And it sounds so stupid, but it's literally just a math equation. If you built the model correctly, it should work in most cases. Obviously there are exceptions. If you, if like a huge recession happened, like yeah, you can't retire early that easily, but you know what? I'm a little lucky in life, you know? There's, <laughs> I've had pretty much bull markets ever since I started working and it ended around 2020 when coronavirus hit. So back to the job, work smarter, not harder. Literally all you have to do is be in the top 30 or 60% at your company compared to your peers. It is competitive after all. You have to approximate the career trajectories of the other people at your company. So what I did was I looked at my peers who are one to five years older than me. What did their career trajectory look like? If a lot of people got promoted, all you have to do is be in the top 60%. If not that many people got promoted, then you have to be in the top 30%. After that, you may wonder, how do I get into that percentile? Apart from just doing your job, there are a lot of little tricks that you can do to make yourself look more productive than you actually are. And believe it or not, perception of work is much more important than actual work. If you're at an office job, you need to be sending a couple emails at around like one to 3 a.m. before you sleep. And every now and then you do that, it looks like you worked all night that week. Uh, I purposely also don't respond to emails right away to make it look like I'm busy. And sometimes I even wait a day or two so that people have lower expectations of me responding right away. And expectations management is just super important whenever you're working. It may sound dumb, but it really does go a long way because if you start your job and you're just responding to emails right away, everyone's gonna expect that of you. But if you wait, and then you even answer early one day, people are probably gonna be like, wow, like this dude's, oh, that was like a faster response than what I normally get. But more into this later. The best part was after I hit my fire number, I pretty much just stopped trying at my job. I did like a full on quiet quitting instead of like a semi quiet quitting. It was, it was a great feeling. I could have gotten away with more too, but I felt bad because uh, if you do a true quiet quit, you really screw over a lot of the relationships you built over the past couple of years. And the way consulting works, you travel a lot with your managers and you're at the hotel with them. So they're pretty much your second family. And at the hotel, you hang out and stuff, you drink every night. And ah, man, I wish I wasn't that close to them because if I wasn't, I'd have a couple more grand in my pocket because if you do a true quiet quit, you get laid off and then you get like layoff money. But I, I just quit normally because I didn't want to put them through that nonsense. What you would do normally is just stop responding to every email, burn all your bridges and don't care. And the company will keep paying you because it takes a long time to fire someone. Believe it or not, it's like one of the luxuries of being a worker at like a decent company. You, it's hard to get fired. People don't realize this and they don't take advantage of it. And I didn't take advantage of it either because I felt bad because if I do that, my bosses are gonna get so many emails from HR trying to contact me and uh, I just didn't wanna put them through it. Human emotions, you know, I wish I didn't have them sometimes. If I was a complete sociopath, I'd be a lot more successful in life. But yeah, some of you may be wondering, why did I keep working at the same company even though I hated it from day one? Ah, you also hear this thing of, oh, if you change jobs, you like get a higher salary. But honestly, if you do the whole minimum effort for each promotion thing, it really saves you a lot of time because it takes a long time to apply to different companies and then sometimes the offers are better than they seem and then sometimes they really work you at the new company. So if you find a job that's like not that much effort, you probably should keep it if you are a bit lazy like me. Again, I'll give a crash course on how to do the bare minimum at your job and still get promoted. Uh, so if you wanna hear more about that, like. Subscribe below for more info on that. But if you keep getting promoted, there's no reason to change jobs because the whole point of changing jobs is to either get a promotion through that or get a pay raise. And promotions do the same thing. 
Uh, so I didn't have that much of an incentive to do that. One thing I will say though is a lot of people are great at making money. Not a lot of people are good at keeping the money they earn. This is something my grandmother taught me uh, ever since I was a kid. That was one of her main lessons, I would say. Uh, but saving money, a lot of it is like a video game. So pretend your life is a video game. There are resources such as money, such as food, but money is considered one of the most important ones. And the reason why is because it could be exchanged for almost any other item in this video game of life. However, if money was overpowered, which it is, why are people using it so frivolously? <laughs> Like money is literally one of the most important resources if you're not super duper rich and a lot of people just spend it really easily and don't save it at all. And that's just not an optimal strategy if you were playing life like a video game. So I don't want to get too video gamey because I know not everyone plays games, but one term that people use is the meta and that is called the most efficient tactic available. And in life, accumulating money and keeping it it's probably one of those like most important things to do and yeah no one teaches this schools don't teach this a lot of parents don't teach this personal finance is super easy if you just save the money you earn and luckily for me my grandmother taught me how to do this whoa you guys must be wondering like why is a traditional old Chinese lady telling you about money well like my family is not very traditional uh, my grandmother actually went to college so whenever I hear about these things of like oh like Traditional China, so misogynistic. Like, my grandmother pretty much ran my family, which is <laughs> a lot different from a lot of other families. And, like, my grandfather was in the military, so we're definitely, like, very conservative in that sense. But even then, like, people are good at different things. And my grandmother's <laughs> probably one of the most financially savvy person in my family. And, yeah, she's probably one of the worst cooks you could ever imagine. Like, so whenever people talk about, like, oh, like, your Chinese grandma probably cooks all the... Like, no. Her food was absolute garbage. Like, I'm sorry, grandma, but like, <laughs> your food was horrible. She knows that already. So <laughs> back to the topic, she taught me a lot about money. Her story is actually incredible because she was actually born to a very rich family in China, but then communist China took all the money away and then she was left with nothing. She worked around in Hong Kong a bit with my grandfather and then they eventually moved to America and they sold everything they had to buy the ticket. And then they came to America with nothing, and then she built mini real estate business. And she did that by working minimum wage jobs, saving up, and investing in properties. So, so you know, some of you may be wondering, like, oh, uh, back in the day, how come houses were able to be bought on minimum wage salaries? Well, the thing is, that was the meta back then, and the meta back then was buying property. And now the meta changed. I actually asked my dad this. I was like, yo, if your mom was here today, her strategy just wouldn't work. What would she do? What, what should all the new Chinese immigrants coming to America do if they have nothing? And he was like, well, there are plenty of other assets to invest in. It doesn't have to be real estate. Real estate just happened to be cheap at the time. And the math worked out that it was a good investment. She'd probably just invest in something else. Who knows? Maybe she would have been one of the first people into Bitcoin in 2007 or whenever Bitcoin came out if she were born a little bit later. But yeah, how did someone who couldn't speak English make it in America with no money and no friends. And back then people were a lot more racist than they are now. People don't realize that. Racism in like, well, when did she come here? Like the 60s or 70s were much worse than they are now. And she had nothing and she still made it. So that's why I believe that almost anyone can make it because nothing ever stopped her, you know? Maybe, maybe this stuff is in my blood or something, but uh, she taught me how to save, she's taught me how to make money, and she most importantly taught me about the concept of inflation. Sorry, I lost my composure a bit because she unfortunately is not with us anymore, and I wish she was still here because I wasn't old enough to learn from her about investing because she passed away around like maybe 10 years before I started working. So I do wonder what her outlook on today's environment would have been. But we all know about the memes about how much a penny can buy back in the 60s. It really was true. Government loves inflation for some reason, and it'll happen for the rest of our foreseeable lives. In fact, they teach in economics class why inflation is important. Essentially, it's to get people to spend money. If inflation did not exist, people would just never spend money because there's no rush to spend the money. But if inflation does exist, maybe you do want to buy that car because next year it'll be more expensive, for example. And inflation is essentially the government's way of countering all the people who hoard all their cash. 
And the way to counter that counter is by investing because most investments grow at a rate that is higher than inflation. So back to saving, you'll notice that all your coworkers, their spending is absolutely ridiculous. Upon starting my job, we were only making 65,000 per year, only. It is a big number, but for a college grad in like a premium job, it's not that much. But I know someone who bought a new Lexus SUV and rode it on their first trip to work. In fact, she picked me up in it and we went to like some networking event in it. I was just like, damn, nice car. <laughs> but keep in mind, remember how I said I made above average salary? Well, in 2015, that average was around $50,000 per year. And so above that is not really Lexus territory, is it? But people still had them. And some of my other friends, they bought convertibles, they bought sports cars. Some people were going out to lunch every day. Some people had really big houses or very new houses. Uh, you know, the works. Uh, in a future video, I'll release my spending of all my five years in DC. I spend under $28,000 per year. My housing expenses was around 1,900 to 2,000 per month on average and I had a one bedroom apartment. So I, I did live in like some luxury, right? I didn't completely save everything. I could have lived in like a spare room for 300 a month, but everyone has their own vices, right? But spending under 28,000 a year in one of the most expensive cities in the world, I say that's pretty damn good, but I'll release every single bit of my spending on that in a future video. If you need immediate tips to save money though, I gave a sample food diary on $1 and $5 meals, which you could check out up here. And they're both like good recipes and also easy to make. So now onto investing because we've talked about how important saving money is, but government counters saving money through inflation. So let's learn how to counter inflation through investing. And this is not financial advice and I'm not qualified to give financial advice, but I believe that most people would benefit by investing into broad index funds and not spend any more time in the subject because it's a really passive strategy and you're buying all the biggest companies in the US and the US, a lot of the big companies, they have a very big global footprint. So it's very diverse exposure across the board. And you could pretty much forget about learning everything else about investing if you just stop there. That's really all most people, like 90% of people need to know but I like to delve a little deeper. But if you wanna squeeze just a little bit more juice out of that orange, and if you like investing, I, I personally do like investing, uh, you could get into more of it. I believe I earned a 30% compounded annual growth rate throughout my entire working career, uh, where I was investing all my money, and that was around double the return of the S&P 500, which was around 17% in the same time frame. And this was all done with specific stocks, individual stocks, and no crypto, I, I didn't like crypto back then, uh, except for like, I had like a very small position in Dogecoin, but it's so minuscule that it doesn't change anything in the big picture. And it was nuts because it was great gains and it definitely accelerated my timeline, but it wasn't make or break at all. Instead of firing in five and a half years, maybe it would have taken me six years if I just did the S&P 500. But was it worth all the time I spent into investing by learning about all the stocks and learning how to do analysis and also taking a big risk in all my predictions and stuff? Uh, probably not at the time, but maybe if I was a multimillionaire, it definitely would have been worth the time, but I did spend a lot of time in it. That's pretty much what I did at my job when I wasn't working. I was just researching what to buy and uh, <laughs> doing like, analysis on on businesses but yeah so overall not worth the time but if you really like it go ahead and do it that's what i did but yeah for 90 99 percent of people s p 500 is probably more than enough so we covered how i was before working we covered how i was during my career and we also saw how i saved and invested all my money let's get into the challenges i faced along the way and the advantages i had because i did have a lot of privilege in my life i do acknowledge that a lot of people are like oh you weren't self-made because uh your mom fed you one night when you were two years old like <laughs> of course no one is purely self-made no one comes out of the womb and takes care of themselves until they're a multi-billionaire like <laughs> but i will discuss the disadvantages and advantages that i had so other people can do a personal comparison and see like how their life fared so because of my demographic, I do really think it was much harder for me to get into any college. And also it's really hard to get a good job in tech because there are just so many people in my same demographic there, right? Why would they pick me over the math champion from Vietnam as I use as a, <laughs> as a common example? I say this because he actually did go to my school and yeah, it's like 
that kid went to, I think, MIT or something. And yeah, if you were to pick one Asian male over the other, average Asian American versus this poor kid from Vietnam who's the math champion in the country, like, it's a very easy choice, right? And I have this post-it note on my wall that says, be so good they can't ignore you. And that, that's what he did. You know, as much as I complain about all this affirmative action BS, if I was better, it wouldn't matter because that's just how life works. If you're so good where you could go through all these barriers, then you'll succeed no matter what. Unfortunately, I am a mere mortal. I am not a genius by any means. So yeah, I guess Harvard's not in the question for me, you know? But yeah, I don't care what the courts rule because a lot of colleges are getting sued for racism. If you just look at the numbers, it's so obvious, you know? <sighs> People say that, oh, the college acceptances should be reflective of what the population demographic is in the U.S. But they accept so many kids from out of the country. And guess what is the most popular racial demographic in the world? It's, it's Asian. There are tons of people in China, tons of people in Japan, all of Southeast Asia, like India. India and China are like, what, more than half the world's population or something like that? So it's, it's not a good comparison because they're taking kids from there and... They're using their demographic to reflect what is in the U.S., but they're not Asian Americans. So I'm not saying don't accept people from other countries, but I'm competing against more people than my non-Asian peers in America, which just isn't a fair fight. <laughs> I'm literally competing against half the world, right? It is what it is, but I wish people just took in kids based on merit because that would make the most sense, right? Hopefully this changes in the future, but in our selectively woke culture in the U.S., where every other racial demographic that is a minority in the U.S. has an easier time getting into colleges than the majority, Asians are the only ones who have a harder time. It's actually ridiculous. I cannot believe this happens, but the U.S. is selectively woke, and it really pisses me off. Not to mention that most of the immigrants from Asia, the parents don't even speak English. Like, my parents do, but all my cousins, a lot of them, their parents barely speak any English. Like, I know a lot of my friends, their parents barely speak English. You can't tell me that kid has an advantage from his upbringing because like, they just don't speak English. Whereas every student in America that was born in America, most of them, their parents have been speaking English, their grandparents speak English, their great-great-grandparents have been speaking English. It's not a fair fight. And yeah, I wish the college matriculation system was a little different. But of course, I am by no means disadvantaged because I grew up in a nuclear family with strong financial background and yeah, second generation immigrants. Second generation immigrants actually are the ones that experience the most class mobility. There are a lot of studies on this, whereas first generation, it's obviously really tough because they don't have that much time to move up in classes. But uh, apparently second generation immigrants outshine even people who were born here. Being a 90s kid, I did miss most of the racism from the 60s and 80s, but not obviously not all of it disappeared, right? There are still some I experienced, but I am mentally advantaged over other people. I had a good upbringing, for example, and it definitely helps my cause because if I really want to get good at something, I will succeed in it almost no matter what. I might not be the best at it, but I'll at least be a top percentage in whatever field that is. And apparently not a lot of people can do that, so that is something that is lucky on my part. This can be evidenced in my experience in chess and video games. So it sounds stupid, but chess is essentially a video game. I don't know why video games get such a bad rap when chess is essentially the same thing, but whenever I mention I play chess, people automatically think I'm smarter, even though I don't think that's the case. In fact, some of the dumbest people I know, they play chess because their brains aren't working properly. Uh, but topic for a different day. But in these games, there are ranking systems. And these ranking systems, they're very absolute. There's no judgment involved in knowing who the better chess player is. You have a rating and it's either higher or lower than someone else's, which means you're the better player. Sure, you can still lose to the other person, but it'll happen less often than it does if you were to bet on it. And in video games and chess, there's no judgments involved. All the rankings are, they're very accurate. There's no biases. And they're also public and percentile based. And these games also have a very low barrier to entry, which means anyone can do it. So if you compare this to acting, acting, you pretty much just have to be good in the eyes of the judge. And that can be done through sleeping with one of the judges, for example. Um, this can be seen in Hollywood, right? It's not merit based in Hollywood, but in baseball, like definitely merit based. In soccer, definitely merit based because they're just gonna pick whoever the best is and 
The reason why is because they're going to get the best performance on their team because of that. But video games are the same thing. Low barrier to entry and rankings are very public and very absolute. But the low barrier to entry to these games also means that it is more difficult to be a higher percentile because there are more people competing at it. For example, I respect a professional soccer player much more than I respect a professional lacrosse player. It's not because a professional lacrosse player is bad, but it's just so much more difficult to become a pro soccer player because everyone in the world plays soccer. So. That's why there's a little more respect there. But yeah, in chess, in video games, I've always been very good at them. Very high percentiles in the rankings. Uh, played in a lot of tournaments in them. And I'm sure this ability has helped me in my day job because it probably means I can like think better than other people, I'm guessing. I don't know how to give concrete examples of that, but it's just something that probably is true. I'm good at solving puzzles. I'm good at pattern recognition, things like that. This probably helped me in my investing endeavors. This probably helped me on my YouTube channel. But yeah, just a fun fact, my YouTube channel, while it does generate like a livable wage, um, it doesn't, it didn't really change that much in my whole financial independence output uh, because it just, wasn't needed. I had more than enough, even without the YouTube income. Because uh, honestly, I don't make that much from it, but it is nice to have, I'd say. I literally just made the channel because I like playing the game. If you are a viewer from my other channel, you may have noticed I am posting less, and that's because I enjoy the game less now. So I really only make videos when I want to make videos for that. And yeah, contrast this to like 99% of other financial YouTubers where they mainly made all their money from their YouTube channel. It's completely different because you can't replicate what they did, but you can definitely replicate what I did because I did not fake it till I made it. I made it, then I'm going to keep doing it, you know? <laughs> to sum it up, like, I do have high mental aptitude and I came from a good family with good family values, uh, but I maybe had to work harder than others with the same skill set because, again, the barriers for schools and, like, workplace is just so much higher based on your demographic. And I hate the victim mentality. I, I really do because I see other people doing this for other races and I'm like, oh, that's BS because of this, this and that. And you're probably thinking the same thing of me, but you just look at the numbers and it's not even disputable. You know, when I was in first grade, <laughs> we learned about Martin Luther King and, you know, equality is a good thing. Uh, you know, maybe we should treat people based on the content of their character, not the color of their skin. And that just doesn't happen in the U.S. People judge based on your skin color more so than anything else, like especially online. It's actually ridiculous. But I learned this at a very young age. So I'm very fortunate that I learned that because <laughs> a lot of people I know, they only figured that out when they're 29 like me. But yeah, being above average on all criteria for the best school in the country at the time, it probably still is. It's Andover. Uh, I couldn't get into worse schools than Andover. How stupid is that when I'm above the averages for the best one? <laughs> beyond, beyond me, right? Discussion for another day, but I did want to shine some light on this because it will show you how my experience can vary from yours. And maybe you face the same struggles as me. Maybe you face worse struggles than me. Maybe you had easier time than me. No matter what though, again, based on the quote on I have on my wall, be so good they can't ignore you. If you were just better, none of this none of these barriers would affect you. But I just feel so cheated because what I learned in first grade about MLK and his speech, it just never held true for the rest of my life. And it's, it's honestly a real shame. But that's essentially my retirement journey, like my fire journey, if you want to call it. I retired at around 28. So I started working at around 22, 23. And then five and a half years later, boom, I'm done. <laughs> it was really nice. And yeah, quiet quitting before it was cool, whatever you want to call it. But yeah, I'll get into more granular topics on how I did it in the future. So definitely subscribe if you're into that and hit the like if you enjoyed this. But I will be posting once a week on this channel. And yeah, it'll just be all about uh, my fire journey, both in the past and what's going to happen in the future, because things change and maybe who knows, maybe I even go back to work. I doubt it, but maybe I will. But yeah, someone would have to offer me like a really, really good job. That's really easy, which just wouldn't happen. But uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed this and I will see you all later.